Good, good morning, everybody. I know that the, the, we had a couple more that were here. I'm not sure where they've... We, we know we have many out traveling. If you didn't know, we are a church in two locations today. So, uh, though, and actually three, because if you're online with us, that's another location. So we're glad that however you're here, you're here, whether you're up at uh, the Vega Lake and uh, just Paul and Kathy are sharing the word right now. So we're excited about what God is doing up there. Um, we're also excited about what he's going to do right here in our time together. Uh, let's, let's invite his presence. Let's, let's just ask the Lord to, to come and, and meet with us. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to come together, to worship you, to open your word together. And I just pray that you would guide us as we, as we go through everything today. Lead us, move us in your direction, in your heart, in your will, in your purpose, in your time. Lord, we love you. We pray for those that are up at the lake today, just uh, worshiping you up there. And uh, just pray your, your blessing on their time of, of fellowship, their time of gathering, and their time of word even right now as they are uh, sharing that. And Lord, uh, we just invite you into this room and in this space, wherever it's at, wherever, if somebody's online, where, whatever time of day or week or wherever they're catching this, that right now we just invite your presence to have your way in us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'm going to encourage you to stand as we just uh, ready to worship the Lord together this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. We worship you, Lord, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. We worship you, Lord, your rich in love and you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find oh bless the lord Oh, 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 my soul, we worship His holy name. We worship you as never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. We worship your name. that day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, 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 my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Holy name, sing like this. 
will worship your holy name. Could we give him praise this morning? You are worthy, God. There is no one like you, Lord God. God, we lift you up and we worship you because you are worthy of our praise. And you are a faithful God. kindness you have poured out grace brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time of need Lord I can't help but sing faithful you are promises are yes and amen. You are good, Lord. Your word is truth and life, God. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes. You have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are, yes you are. All your promises are yes and amen. You are worthy, Lord. We can trust you with everything we are. So why will rest in your promises? My confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Yes, I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Oh, I will.
yes, you are, Lord. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Yes, Lord. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. You are worthy, Lord. For great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. For great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have need is thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see, all I have need is thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You are worthy of our praise, God. Lord, this morning we just acknowledge your faithfulness. As we have a weekend where we celebrate the the ability to work and the production that you've given us and the, the opportunities that we've had as a nation to be able to grow and to thrive. We're thankful for that, but God, Lord, we're thankful most of all for your faithfulness. For whatever the ups and downs are, whatever happens in our world, what happens in our nation, whatever happens in our own lives, in our own world, you are faithful. You are faithful, God. So this morning, God, we invite you to just reach into those spaces in our life where maybe we've struggled. Maybe we've not seen your faithfulness. Not recognized it. Not understood what you were doing. And may we this morning recognize your faithfulness is great. Your faithfulness is perfect and you are more than enough. As we sang a moment ago, we said we will rest in his promises. So right now, if you have a need, whether you're online, whether you're in the room, whether you're watching later on or you're right here live with us in this moment, could we just offer those to him and recognize, God, I'm going to rest. I'm going to rest this thing, this situation in your hands. Lord, I pray over my family this morning as they're uh, dealing with illness. And God, I know that um, just we're in a season where there, there's much turmoil over that. I, I'm thankful that we don't have to fear. I'm thankful that we are, we are not shook. We're not afraid. 
And yet we also recognize the need for healing. And so I just pray for your healing, uh, in, in particular over my wife this morning. And Lord, I pray for everybody in this room, Lord God, and everybody online, and everybody who would tune into this right now, Lord, whatever need they're facing, whatever moment they find themselves in, maybe it's a job situation, maybe it's a family crisis, maybe it's a, a crisis of their own making, maybe it's something where they just need a healing touch, maybe it's just a moment that they desperately need you to reveal yourself to them. Lord, your word is truth, and you are faithful. May we rest in that promise, Lord, because you are an awesome God and worthy of our praise. Because faithful you are, faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are, yes you are, Lord. All your promises are yes and amen over every situation. All your promises are yes and amen. Every need we have, all your promises are yes and amen. Every request, Lord God, we bring to your feet. Because you told us, Lord, that if we approach the throne of grace boldly and present our requests and our petitions to you, Lord, that all of our heart and mind will be guarded in the peace that passes understanding, Lord. Because faithful you are, yes, you are. Are yes and amen, yes, so all your promises are yes and amen. Can we just worship him now, God? You are worthy of our praise, you are worthy of our worship, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, and we just invite you to just have your way in our lives. We trust you with all of the situations and all of the stuff. You're a good and a faithful God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I know this is a little different, me standing on the floor, but that's a, we, I just, I thought that you know, I knew we were going to have a bunch of people out of town because we were spread out today. And so I uh, just wanted to, to be down right here with you guys. So I appreciate you all worshiping together. I'm so glad for each and every one that's here this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 77. As you're turning there, um, there, there were bulletins. You just make sure and, and check that for information about things coming up. A uh, couple things. Just uh, we are starting the Kramer Life Group um, that is that is happening in, next Monday night, a week, not tomorrow night, but a week from Monday night at the Kramer's house at 2988 Redbud, which is just straight up the road here right by, turn right before you get to Fruitvale Elementary, and then it's a little driveway down, so you, gotta, you can kind of miss that, but just pay attention to that, and uh, it's a great opportunity to connect with folks, and uh, so we're, we're excited about that coming. Um, also, next Sunday, we will be starting our next uh, series of our growth track, which is basically just an opportunity for you to um, connect with just what is next. What is the next step I need to take to get connected, to get involved, to be in my place that God has me as a part of this church. And so uh, we'll find out about who we are, where we're going. If you're new and this is that you need that information, then that's great. If you've been here a long time and you're saying, you know, I just need to kind of have a refresh on the vision, and not only that, on what it is that God's calling me to do. Great opportunity to be involved in that, whether you're here in the room or you're online um, and you're interested in that. You can reach out to me, you can direct message me if you're online, 
and uh, let me know how we can get you connected with that. We would love to know if you're coming, because that's uh, you just want to be prepared for that. So um, if you could let me know that that as well, that'd be great. So the scripture Psalm 77, Psalm 77, and we're going to start in verse seven. Um, but as you're turning there, I, I, I wonder if any of you have ever had a moment where you wondered, what in the world are you doing, God? What are you doing right now? And maybe you've had a moment where you've been asking the question, where are you? Where are you in whatever it is that I'm going through? Where are you in whatever situation I find myself? Where where has the Lord gone? Maybe you felt like he lost your number uh, or he lost your address for a moment. I, you know, if, if you've been at this for a while, I, I can sing about and praise God about his faithfulness. But the thing that I also recognize is I have these moments where I don't understand what God is doing. Anybody? Am I alone? Is this, is it just, am I just preaching at myself today? I don't know. But, uh, but I, I think we, we don't always understand. And, and the Psalms, I love that the Psalms are there because um, it gives me assurance that, okay, we're on the right track. Because I'm, 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 we're in some pretty good company when you start reading psalmist uh, talking about things that sound like questions that I have. And questions that, that you have. And so uh, I want us to look at that. And then we're, we uh, just have a, a few brief moments together today to just really allow the Lord to speak to us. Could, could we stand, if you were able, one more time, just for the reading of God's word. Um, it, it is, again, if you are able. Psalm 7, starting in verse 7, it says, Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Let's pray. Father, I pray in these next few moments that you would help me to speak nothing more or less than what you have for us today. I pray that you would help me to just allow your word to be what is presented and, and set Hans aside. Get me out of the way. I just want to be the funnel that you pour what you want for today through us, into us. And I pray for our ears to be opened to hear your voice speaking. Speaking clearly and, and directly into each of our hearts and lives. We love you and we just invite you to have your way in this time. Father, take your word and do whatever you want. Could you pray that with me? Father, take your word and do whatever you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I, I picked out this portion from the middle of this psalm that sounds pretty rough. <laughs> the, this moment where the psalmist is saying, God, what are you doing? You have forgotten. You have forgotten everything that is going on in my world. You have forgotten what is happening in my life. You have forgotten where I live. You've forgotten the, the issues. And, and many of us, if, if you've been serving Christ for a, a minute, or maybe you're just kind of on the edges and you're saying, I'm not really sure. You, you've been in these moments where it's like, God, where are you in this? Where are you in, in COVID and, and, and all of that? Where are you in the midst of my family and the situation that's going on there? Where are you in the middle of uh, just stuff like the politics and the division of our nation today? Where are you at in, in the issues of, uh, you know, when we look and say, oh, you know, God, you are in control. God, you rule and you reign. And then we see what is going on in Afghanistan with the church. And we say, God, what is going on with this? What is happening? Are you, have you, have you cast us off? Have you just forgotten and just left us to ourselves? And the, the psalmist is, is certainly in this moment. And, and many of us go through maybe not just a moment of it, but we, maybe we've gone through seasons of it. Uh, some some uh, scholars have called this the dark night of the soul, this, this idea that we go through a time where it's like, God, you just moved. Like all the things that I used to do, they, they don't work the same anymore. 
Like I, I, I pray, and, and even in my prayer, I, I, a young man gave me this, gave this term years ago in a Bible study. Uh, one of my student leaders was, was leading a group of guys in a Bible study, and he said, have you ever felt like your prayers were just chewing rocks? We're just chewing rocks. And I, I have never forgotten that, that thought because that is the, the picture. Because I'm like, yes, that is how it feels sometimes when it's like, man, I'm just, I'm praying. I'm doing all the things that I know I'm supposed to do. And yet, it, it's like, like chewing rocks, right? And chewing rocks, if, if you don't know, that's, 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 hard, that's hard work. That's, that's not, not, it's not very productive either. It's not, not very satisfying to... Uh, hunger or to your teeth, right? Um, but, but we go through seasons where we feel isolated or we feel distant and we don't understand God's timing or even his apparent absence. Like God, you, you moved, you left the building. And yet in the middle of all of that, we need to recognize that no matter what, that God is faithful. So, so let's back up. I want us to read through this psalm. It's in Psalm 77, starting in verse 1, it says, I cried out to God with my voice, and to God with my voice he gave ear to me. Now, other translations say, so that he would listen. Like, there, there's this sense of like, I'm not sure he's listening, and yet he's still saying, in, this, in the, the New King James here, it's, Are we there? There we go. Okay. Some of you may be wondering, like, why does that matter? There's, there's not enough of us you could talk over that. But this is for those that are listening in online. So, okay. Um, but this, this translation here in the New King James, it says, He gave ear to me. Like, he's, he's speaking it from a place of recognizing something that he desires and declares even though he doesn't feel it right there in that moment. Because if you read on, you're going to find that it doesn't sound like somebody who thinks that God's listened to him, at least not right, right yet. So, so let's go. It says, in the day of my trouble, I sought for the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah, or pause and think about it. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I can't even speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes a diligent search. And then we come to what we started with. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has he, his promise failed forever? Has he forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Again, pause and think about it. So, so there's this tension, this moment of, and, and, and like I said, I believe we've all been there. We've all been in these moments where it's like, God, I could use some mercy right now. I could use some help right now. I could use some strength. I could use your peace. And yet it seems that it doesn't come. And yet here's what the psalmist is saying. Go on. He says, and I said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. Think about it. Stop. Pause. Listen. 
The water saw you, O God. The water saw you, and they were afraid. The depths trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a silent, uh, sent out a sound, and your arrows flashed about. Your voice, uh, the voice of your thunder, was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea. Your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And then in chapter 78, it goes on to really just recount stories and moments of God's faithfulness, of the way that God acted. And so what we need to understand is the first thing that we have to do in these moments is whether or not we feel it. Because here's the problem. Our culture and our, our training is to be consumed with how you feel. Right? Right? Like, no matter what, oh, you just got to feel right. I, we even use it in the church. Like, it creeps into, like, I was praying about what to do. I wanted God to give me some direction, and I just had some peace about it. Right? Anybody heard that, that phrase? Like, I just had a peace about it. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't give us a peace about things, but there's times when we get a peace about something that God's Word is clearly in conflict with, and guess what? That is no peace at all. You might feel good about it. You might feel all right for the moment about still hating that person who wronged you. But I'm telling you, that's not peace and that's a lie. And so so there's this sense of we've got to recount and remember no matter how we feel. Okay, that I somehow got into a sermon for a different day, but but I I want us to to recognize this. He's saying, look, don't don't let these moments of feeling like you're chewing rocks make you miss the truth of what God has already done. And so he says, start recounting, start remembering. And so he goes back and he's, he's rec- recognizing the reference here is to Egypt and God bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt. Now let's think about this story for a moment. If you don't know the story, um, you, you, it's a good one. You should read it. It's really great. In Exodus, uh, God bringing his people, but, but the, the reality is uh, most of us, even non-church people, know about Moses, and they know about this Red Sea thing. They're not sure they know all the details or know all the stuff, but we all have kind of seen, you know, whether it's your generation was the Charlton Heston version or you were grew up in the Prince of Egypt version or whichever uh, way that that story was depicted, it's, it's been depicted picked it outside the church as well as in. But what we see is that, that God brings these people out of Egypt with show, a show of force. Like he shows the Egyptians, I'm God and you're not. With no, with, with no uncertainty whatsoever. With no lack of clarity, he says, I am God and you're not. And so the Egyptians let them go. And, and Pharaoh lets him go kind of uh, belligerently and regretting that he's letting him go, but he does it. Uh, the people of Egypt are glad to see him go. They're so glad to see him go, they give him all their stuff. They're like, oh, here's all our gold, here's all our silver. We don't, we'll, you take anything you want because you're God. I don't want him messing with us anymore. See, the people of Israel got it, but Pharaoh's heart was hard and he missed it. So he sends the army after the people of Israel after they're out in the desert. Well, God takes the people. Remember, he, if you don't know the story, he's leading them by a cloud of, by day and a pillar of fire by night. And he takes them the wrong way. He takes them a route that doesn't make sense. He takes them out straight out into the desert, not up towards the highway, not up towards the short path that would have taken a couple months and they would have been there. But he takes them out towards a dead end or so it seems. And how many of us have found ourselves where God is leading us down a road that looked like a dead end and we were arguing with him the whole way? God, this isn't the right way. You don't know what you're doing. And how many, hello, anybody? Am I the only one? You know, when I was in kindergarten, this started early for me, this whole idea, and I've, I've told this story before, but when I was in kindergarten, my parents, um, we, we changed, I think we moved, and because we moved, um, we, and that was the last time they, my parents still live in the house, they moved in when I was in kindergarten. But because we moved, I, I had to switch my class from the uh, morning to the afternoon or something. And the, so the bus driver is going to take me home at the, it, it, no, I was in the morning class. In the afternoon class, they moved in the morning. I'm telling two different stories. I'm sorry. So anyhow, the bus driver is taking me home. That, let, let me get to this. But the bus driver is taking me home. 
And you know how the school bus works, okay? Like they go and they drop all these people off. Well, kindergartner Hans does not understand that's not how I got to school, right? Like I, my parents have driven me to this school. I've seen the way we got to the school. And so as I'm about to get off the bus, I get up to, they, they're dropping me off at my house. And I, I stop at the bus driver and I say, you know, there's a lot faster way to get to my house. Some of you, okay, you're going to have to get that maybe a lot later. I, I, but I was sure that he just didn't know where he was going. And that's why we made all these other stops and all these other kids got off first. Because obviously it's all about me, right? Anybody else have been all about you at some point in your life? Uh, okay, all of us, all of us, that's us. And so we're doing the same thing with God. We're standing at the bus driver's chair saying, God, um, there's a way better way to do this. Anybody? There's, there's a way better direction. Like, we could have been here a lot faster with a lot less pain and a lot less problems if you just listened to me back there and gone this way. But see, God has a purpose. He has people that he has to drop off. He has people that he has to put into our path. He has lessons that he has to teach, and he has places that he has to take us. And so he takes them out into the Red Sea, and they get to the edge of it, and they're standing there looking at this going, what are we doing? And about the time that settles in on them that they're going to have to go all the way up and around the Red Sea. If you don't know about the geography, they've traveled down into this little hook of this thing. And they have to go all the way up and around the tip that comes up like two fingers um, up towards the Mediterranean. Doesn't reach all the way there and they could have gone around. That's where the highway, later on called the King's Highway, went. And yet this, uh, this, this little place where they found themselves. They're looking at it going, what are we doing? But then they looked over their shoulder, and what do they see coming but a cloud of dust from chariot wheels? Because the army's coming after them. Now remember, the cloud led them there. The presence of God led them there. They knew it was him. They're rejoicing. They had Passover. They had celebrations. They're like, God showed Egypt who's boss. God, our God is the God. He's the one. And we must be really important because look at what he did for us. And yet they find themselves out there in this dead end, so it seemed, and looking over their shoulder, and the enemy is bearing down on them. If you read the story, and this often doesn't get accounted, but it says that the presence, the cloud of God's presence, moved from in front of the people of Israel to the back of them, so that Pharaoh's army, when he got to them, when he had caught up, he had already caught up to them, it says that the cloud of God's presence prevented them from coming all the way to the people of Israel. But at the same time that's happening, what's happening in the camp? The people are ready to throw Moses in the Red Sea. They're ticked. They're like, you have led us out here to die. You have brought us out. Look at this. Look at Now, what should they have been looking at? You, you guys are too smart for me. You know, you, you, they, they should have been looking at the presence of God and his protection, but instead they're looking at the army that's threatening. God instructs Moses. Moses lifts his hands. The sea parts. They walk across on dry ground. The enemy marches out into that dry ground. The sea collapses on them. The enemy's gone. Change the course of history because it was centuries for, for Egypt to really become an actual power again. Because their army's defeated. And they, why? Because God is faithful. But in the middle of this moment, it doesn't look like God is faithful. It looks like he's leading them into a trap. And by all accounts, by all the world's view, could have easily said, 
It's just a mess. It's a mess. It's a trap. But what happens? The psalmist says, remember. Remember the Red Sea. Remember the enemies when we got into the promised land. Remember, and, and we can go on because we have more of the story than even the psalmist as he's writing this has. Uh, we, we can remember about Elijah and Elisha, and we can remember about Hezekiah and, and the son uh, going back ten steps. We can, we can remember uh, about Joshua and the sun standing still over the battle. We can remember about all of these things that have taken place even since. Throughout this word, we can see God's faithfulness even in places where people did not understand what was going on. In John chapter 11, Jesus shows up at, late for a funeral. He shows up late because his, his close friend has died. Mary and Martha both come out and they're weeping. Jesus, if you had been here, you could have stopped this. You could have saved this. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? Now Mary says, well, I know that you can do all things. I know, I know that in the resurrection he's going to be alive. I know. And yet Jesus is saying, no, 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 you don't understand. Do you believe this? He goes out to the tomb, grieved and weeps, and yet he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes out. Loose him. Get the grave clothes off him. Get any, scent, uh, any sense of any form of death that was on him away from him because he is alive. And Jesus showed himself faithful even in the dark moment. For these sisters who felt like, Jesus, if you had done it different. But if he had done it different, their brother would have been healed. But they wouldn't have understood that when he said he's the resurrection and the life, that he meant it. That it was truth. We can go on even to Jesus' own life and look and say, you know, on Friday when Jesus breathed his last and says it's finished and then the sky goes dark and, and Jesus is buried and put in a tomb and we can look at that and be in this moment of Friday or even Saturday saying, God, you've forgotten us, you've left us and God is working his plan because Sunday is on the way. We need to remember we need to remember the life of the apostles who, though, when they were persecuted, that scattering that took place because they were being persecuted actually grew the church exponentially. It took it to levels and to places where without the persecution, without the, the seeming blocks to the growth of the church, it would have never grown the way that it was supposed to grow. We can look at the spread. We can look at the survival of the church. We can look back and remember that over and over, whether it was in a communism moving into Russia and they are trying to eliminate all form of religion and faith in God from that place, and yet today the church stands. We can think back to, to Mao and the whole progression of, of communism down into China and how that sense of we are going to defeat God, we are going to deny him, we are going to reject him, we are going to eliminate him from our culture. And it drove the church underground and the church grew hundreds of times more underground than it ever was growing above ground. Why? Because God knows what he is doing. We can remember how he's preserved his word, even though many have tried to burn it and destroy it and get rid of it and eliminate it. Though some have hoarded it and said, no, you can't understand it. You can't read it for yourself. And they've even used the church, the, 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 the leadership of, of what was supposed to be church, what was supposed to be the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And, and they, they said, no, 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 you can't read this. You can't, cha you can't challenge us. You can't, and, and, and along comes Martin Luther, and along comes the, the Wycliffe, and uh, along comes Gutenberg, and uh, along comes all these that are, are presenting and bringing the access to the Word of God. And, and yet, through all of that, God preserves His Word through its attempted destruction, through its rejection, through all of the stuff. We need to remember. We need to remember our own story. Because I, I've said this, it is a miracle that 
any of us made it out of childhood. Hello? It is a miracle that any of us survived adolescence. Now, you might think, well, I grew up pretty fast, and I got some common sense, and I learned some things. But how many of you can say, I, I can point to multiple moments in my life where that should have been the last moment. Hello? And yet God is faithful. Now, I, I'm going to name the elephant here because the reality is there are times when some, for some that was the last moment. And we're like, what was up with that, God? You preserved me. You kept me. Why, why not them? Why not? We need to remember that he knows what he's doing. Whether it's through grief and loss of those that were way too young. Or whether it's the moments where we, we say, God, you could have done this so much faster. You could have gotten to my house so much quicker. We recognize that God is calling us to remember our own story, the way that he saved us, the way that he captured our hearts. He's calling us not only to recognize your own story, but he's calling you in these moments of the place where you have the greatest struggle, the greatest moment of blindness to the presence of God to open your eyes. See, that's what the people of Israel were missing as they're complaining to Moses, open your eyes. Can you see what God is doing right here? If he can cover you in a cloud so that an army will not attack you, what are you worried about? You don't need the sea to open. You don't need to see the miracles that you think, oh, well, God, if you would just do what you did back then, if you would just do, the, let me tell you, the, the same God and the same power that did every miracle of this word is still alive today. He is still at work today, and he is still doing miracles today, but we so often have our eyes closed because we're looking for a sea to part open while the cloud of God's presence fights for us. It stands at the rear guard saying, you will not come any closer. These are my children. You can't have them. Because God is faithful. I will remember I will open my eyes. I will recognize what I, I can see that's right in front of me that so often I'm so blinded by the trouble, so blinded by the threat, so blinded by the circumstance that I don't want to be in that I miss how God is protecting and preserving and keeping me right in the middle of the storm. Open your eyes that the cloud is between you and the army. We often miss the forest for the trees, don't we? We don't see the very thing that we're looking for. Because we're looking for a forest and I just can't see it. I just can't. Man, if all these trees were out of the way, I could maybe see the forest. I realize that's a ridiculous thought and a ridiculous saying, but it's true. And we do it so often. He's called us to open our eyes to see it. To see him working, to see his hand, to see his faithfulness in the middle of whatever moment you find yourself, whether it is the greatest grief and loss, whether it is confusion, whether it is doubt and worry, whether it is fear, whether it is an attack, whether it is sickness, whether it is shame and guilt, whether it, whatever it is, we need to open our eyes and see the presence of God and go beyond our feelings. Go beyond what we, all the warm fuzzies that we say, well, God, if you would just show yourself to me like you did that one day in that altar that one time. 
if you would just show yourself to me and like, like I need you to, if you would just do it this way, there's a quicker way to my house, God. And he's saying, I need you to, to trust me and recognize me in the middle of your circumstance. I need you to hear the still small voice that's not the big earthquake. It's not the firestorm. It's not the, all, all the bolts of lightning. It's not all the, the stuff that you so often associate with God showing up and God showing his power. Could you recognize that he's still here even when he's not in all that other stuff? Elijah was at a moment where he had lost sight of it. And God reminded him, you're not alone. You're not alone. And this day, as we think about whatever it is that we face in whatever moment, and maybe this word is not for this moment of your life. There will come a moment. And he's faithful to walk you through it. And you, it doesn't have to be extended darkness. It doesn't have to be extended fear and panic and, and wondering, God, what are you doing and where'd you go and did you forget my number? Because you can remember. Don't stop at verse 9 saying, has, has God forgotten to be gracious? Has his anger shut up his tender mercies? What, did he, is, is he so upset that he's just left me out? But the Lord is always faithful. And he is always on time. So Abraham, i close with this story. Abraham hears from God that he's got a promise. God shows up, says, hey, go move to a land that I'm going to show you. Not telling you how to get there. Not even going to tell you where there is. You'll just, I'll just tell you when you're there. Do what I said. And Abraham, this man of faith, he does it. But along the road, you find that Abraham's faith was not as perfect as it sounded at first. Because he didn't just jump up and never look back. He didn't look back on the land. He didn't look back on the, those things. But, but along the way, he, he tried to force God's hand. He tried to move him faster. He tried to protect himself when God was saying, I got you. Multiple times lying about his wife being his sister because he was afraid people were going to kill him because his wife was beautiful. Well into her 70s and 80s, just, just saying. And yet, in the middle of all that, he comes to a moment where God shows up and he says, I'm renewing my promise with you. And Abraham sits inside of his tent and he says, God, what good is your promise to me? What good is it for you to make all these promises? I don't have anyone to give my inheritance to. The person who's going to gain my inheritance is my servant. I don't have a son. There's no heir. There's no one. This is, this is even before the whole situation with Hagar and Ishmael. And, and Abram is saying, look, I, I, God, I, I, you're, you're, you're not coming through. You said you'd give me a son. And here I am 15 years into this promise and, and nothing. And he's sitting inside the tent and he says, look, God. Look at this situation. Look at the circumstance from inside the tent. I love God. I love what he does here. He says, Abraham, come here. And he says, look at the stars. Now, do you get to look at stars from inside the tent? Maybe if your tent's broken, right? <laughs> you know? 
So he takes him outside. He get, has to get him outside of that cloud of doubt and fear and all the stuff. He says, look, try counting. And as Abram sits there and is like, okay. Okay, God, I get your point. What, what are you, why? Why are you telling me to count? I can't. Your, your descendants are going to outnumber them. God, what do you mean? Did you, I, I told you to look. And God says, no, I told you to look. I told you to open your eyes. I'm the one who hung those stars. I'm the one who spoke them into existence. I'm the one who can do whatever I need to do, whenever I need to do it, and I will get it done. You need to look. Trust me. Are we walking in that kind of faith? Or are we inside of our tents? Because here's the beauty. Even when Abram was faithless, God was faithful. In Timothy, Paul writes to this young man who he's mentoring and discipling and training up as a pastor. And he gives us this little song. And the first part is harsh. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we, if we abandon him, we're, we're... And yet it says, but if we are faithless... He remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I'm thankful this morning that God is a God who is faithful even when I'm not. Now, he calls us to serve him, and he calls us to honor him, and he calls us to not deny him. He calls us to not turn our backs on him. There, there is a, an, a, a thing for us to do in this. But yet, whenever we find ourselves facing these moments where it's like, God, I don't, I don't understand. I don't get this. He remains faithful. But can we remember? Can we open our eyes? Can we trust in his faithfulness? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word and your truth, and I thank you for the, the fact that though there, there are few in number in this room, God, there's, there's beauty in your people coming together. I'm thankful for each and every one that's here, and I, I pray for those that are online, maybe that, that are hearing this and saying, I don't... I, I've not received that promise from God. And today I need to trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior because I want to be in. If that's the promise that God has for me, if he is that faithful that he can walk me through whatever I'm dealing with, if he, he's ready to open seas or, or guard me when I'm complaining against him, I want to trust him with my life. I want to surrender my life to Jesus today. If that's you, I just want to encourage you right now, just do, you would open your heart and just say, Jesus, I believe that, that God sent you, that your, the Father sent you that, to die on the cross for my sin. And you paid the price in full. I, I, I ask in the name of Jesus. Father God, I ask that you would forgive me, that you would cleanse me from all of my past and all of my guilt and all of my shame, that you would make me new. I want to be a part of this promise, Lord. Help me to follow you with all my heart for all my days. If you're here and you're saying, you know, I, I've, I, I, I've trusted Jesus, I've given him my life, but yet there's so many times where I find myself not able to see the forest for the trees. 
And today, I, I, I just want to renew my covenant with him. I want to renew my commitment to say, God, you are faithful. Help me to remember it. Help me to open my eyes and see it when I don't feel it, when I don't recognize all of the, the, the things that, uh, that it was like in the past. Help me to see you. Help me to hear the still small voice in the middle of those things that I'm facing. And help me to recognize that even in those moments where I have to wait in stillness and you're just quiet, that there's a reason that you are preparing me. That you are working your plan even when I don't see it. Help us, Lord, to trust in your faithfulness.